Thanks, Bob. <laughs> First rodeo on in All right, there we are. Perfect. All right, so we're going to start off this morning with a quiz. All right, so if you wanted to play the lottery, do you think it takes luck to win? What do we think? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, it does take luck to win. But here's the thing. The motto of the lottery. I don't play. play. You can't. You That's right. You can't play. Oh, is that it? What is? You can't win if you don't play. Absolutely. All right. If you have not gone out and bought the ticket, you will not have any luck. And same thing with business opportunities. If you're not out there like you are today, but if you're not engaging with the community, engaging with your clients and prospects, you're not going to have an opportunity to win. Right. It's so. Uh, what was the stat that I have? Is um, I think it's um, what is it? Eighty percent of the lottery winners are quick picks. You believe that, right? So there is a bit of luck that is involved. So one of the things that we always like to do is is figure out where luck comes from. And there was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Richard Wiseman, and he was from Great Britain, and he was one of those that. Always was interested. He was fascinated by learning about people that always felt really lucky versus people that always felt like they were down on their luck. Do we know those people? Oh yeah. Yeah. There's like my next door neighbor. He's always one of those guys that just seems really lucky. He's one that a number of years ago he won a car in one of those twenty-five dollar raffles, right? And then later on he won a big screen TV as well. So I always think of him as like really lucky. But what did he do differently? He actually bought the ticket. Right, which gave him the opportunity to do it. So, as I said, Dr. Richard Wiseman, he was really fascinated with what entailed with luck. And so he did some research studies on it over a course of a period of time. And he found that there were four things, four basic principles of luck. The first one being is that lucky people created and noticed chance opportunities. So, what they did was they saw things where other people didn't. That was the interesting part of luck, right? So they looked at it and they said, boy, that could do something that I think could happen and, and make things good for us, right? Um, the second thing that he found was that lucky people listened to their intuition. How many people have been to a restaurant before, looked at the menu, and something just kind of popped off at you, right? And you're looking at it, man, that sounds really, really good. Anybody been there before? Yeah, Has anybody gone against that intuition and said, you know, maybe you're talking, the waitress comes and shares the specials, or some people are talking like, oh, that sounds good, or this sounds good, and you make a different decision. Is it ever quite as satisfying as a meal when you choose to go in a different direction? Mm -hmm. That's what he found too, is that people that listen to their intuition, you know, we have, as, as we've gone through the, the thousands of years of progressions in our brains, intuition is there to make us safe, right? And so if we go against it, sometimes it's not gonna quite give us the exact outcome that we're looking for. The third thing is he found that positive expectations create self-fulfilling prophecies, right? So being positive, being upbeat, wants, gets people to wanna be around you. And yet there's so much negativity in this world, right? Which brings us down. Have you, what remembers from the show Seinfeld? Mm. Remember that show? Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's getting few and farther between that I can use that reference now because that's back in the 90s. We're almost 25 years past, right? <laughs> so I remember in Seinfeld, remember George Costanza? Mm -hmm. And what he was always down on his luck and nothing was ever happening. He was always a very negative New Yorker. And one year at the end of the season, he said, I'm going to do something different, Jerry. They were sitting in that diner. <laughs> and episode. you remember that episode? And he was like, I'm going to do the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Which all of a sudden, he's going to be positive. He's going to be upbeat. He's going to take chances. And all of a sudden, his life started turning around, right? So it's just a good metaphor for looking at it from the positive side of things. And that's what Dr. Richard Wiseman found out about luck as well. The fourth thing is that he determined that... Uh, resilient attitudes to transform bad to good. 
He found that lucky people or people that associated themselves with being more lucky were more resilient. They didn't find things that got in their way and say, that's going to be a speed bump or that's going to hold me up. They were able to bounce back or find a way around it and move forward. So, of course, when you start thinking about luck, what's the takeaway from these four principles? You create your own luck. Absolutely. You create your own luck, right? There's a lot of times where we think of like, oh, that, that happened to me. No, we have the right and the willingness. We can make things happen for ourselves, right? So over the course of time with Dale Carnegie, our organization's been around for mm -hmm. since 1912, so 111 years. We found out a few things about how we can create our own luck by investing in ourselves and doing things a little bit differently. So the first thing is people do business with people they know. As you know, in a group like this and a networking group, is that when you support each other, it comes around to help you out, right? And now I've been in this business for 19 years. <clears throat> I think I've been part of the chamber for 18 years of those 19 years. And I remember in the old facility, um, I remember sitting down and maximizing that opportunity, like getting out there and working with other people and really figuring out how can we make that happen. And I remember one time I was at a networking event, and I, this was associated with SHRM, Society of Human Resource Managers. And as I was getting into the business, um, they were saying, you know, you have to find out who it is that you profile for your customers. And one of the customers that I had was HR departments, right? They're, they buy training, they buy development, uh, they buy, you know, assessments for their organization. And so I went to one of these SHRM meetings, and it was one of the first times. And in the business I was in before, gosh, it was no opportunity. I sold to automotive dealerships, right? I sold computer systems to automotive dealerships. So this was like so broad. So I narrowed it down to HR, dealer, uh, HR managers. So I went there and I met a financial advisor. And I'm like, man, that's interesting. Financial advisor at a SHRM event. I'm like, hmm, let's talk to her and let's find out. Her name was Michelle. And so I said, you know, what brought you to this? How long you been here? She was like, um, I've been here for about five years now. I go, what do you do? She goes, I'm the membership director. I'm like, oh, it's even more interesting. And she's gotten in, she's gotten invested in here. I said, well, how did it go when you first started? Right, just trying to take the pulse of the whole thing. And she was like, well, it was very slow at first. People held me at arm's length. I'm like, how come? She goes, I'm a financial advisor, right? And they're HR people. They didn't want to hear a big sell. And I was like, okay, well, what happened? She goes, well, you know, one of the things, I was having a tough time in my financial uh, investing. Uh, my book of business was small, and I was getting a lot of pressure from the, uh, from the owners and from my bosses to uh, get out there and do things and make it happen. Or maybe the, the career wasn't going to be for me. She goes, but I always wanted to be a financial advisor. So she looked around, and a lot of the other associations were covered by other people in the firm. And so she said, I'll try this. And once again, arm's length. At the end of her first year, she was contemplating whether she was going to come back. She was contemplating her career. She said, you know what, I'll give it one more chance. And she went to the final networking event, it was kind of a round table. And she sat down at a table with a group of ladies that had this click. You ever been to a networking event that has clicks, right? Mm -hmm. Where they're just, you know, they're they tight and they, they don't let other people in, right? So she sat down with them. And um, one of the women, you know, she was basically being ignored. And one of the women was like, hey, does anybody know a contractor? I have to build it. I have to get a debt bill on my house this year. And this woman, Michelle, she was a financial advisor. She did. Her brother-in-law was a contractor. And she was like, I know someone. You know, I'll give you the name. He's, he's really good. And, you know, he does great work. And she showed him some pictures. And she was like, oh, that's great. Fantastic. So they go away for the summer. They come back September. Michelle's like, oh, I'll give it one more shot, a couple more meetings. Just, and if it doesn't work, I'm going to move on. So she sits, she comes in, and the woman she gave the lead to for the con uh, contractor, see, the contractor came right over to her. She's like, oh my gosh, I've been waiting for you to show up. She goes, I'm so happy. And she told her all about this deck this person built, how great it was, and how impressed she was. And she told all of her friends. She was like, come with me. And she started introducing her to everyone. And then she sat her down. She was like, oh, you guys all got to meet her. And she made the big difference because she got to know somebody, right? 
And she started all those introductions, which started coming in. <clears throat> now, what Michelle was aiming for was she was a 401k specialist. And all of a sudden, her group, her book of business started growing over the next year. It went from about a million and five, two million dollars to about eight or nine million within a year, just because she got to know those people. And so that's why it's so important to put yourself out there and really get to know other people and introduce yourself. Be interested in them. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. The next one is build up the emotional bank account. Right. So we always thought, and this was a, a motto of ours when I was in sales, is that we do something for other people. We make a deposit in their emotional bank account. They'll be more willing to help you out later on. And I remember at one of the chambers that we were involved with, there was an HR group. And so I went to the HR group and I started handing out my cards. Remember when we used to do that? You'd hand out your cards. And what lie did we used to tell each other? Anybody remember the lie? People are going to save them. I'm going to save them. Yeah, yeah. The other lie is, I'll contact you, right? I'll be in touch, right? And then you tuck that card away, and then you get busy doing everything else. And then like six months later, you find it, and you're like, where did I meet that person, mm -hmm. right? So we, we all go through that dance. We do that lie. And I did the same thing. I met this guy, Mike, who was an HR consultant. And, and I like Mike. We had a good time. We were about, you know, we're about the same age. And we started businesses around the same time. And, you know, we were building them up. And so we had a great conversation that night. And so the very next day, very, very interesting. Very next day, I got a call from one of my great clients, right? And I'm about less than a year into my business. So I really need good clients and I need to make them happy. And she called me up. She goes, oh, we got this really complex, very technical uh, human uh, resources uh, issue that's going on. And she was fairly new in HR. And I remember her saying, what do I do with this? And I said, Monique, I have no idea. I go, I didn't come from an HR background. I don't even know which way to direct you. I go, but I met this guy, Mike. He's an HR consultant. Would you like an introduction? I believe he can answer your question very, very easily. And she was like, oh, that would be great. Right? So I, I called Mike and I'm like, hey, Mike, this is the situation. I got this kind of, what do you think? And he goes, oh, man, we've heard that before. I can help her out. No problem. I'll make an introduction. I made that introduction, but nothing of it. Right. Mike was happy. I called Monique about uh, a week later. She was like, oh, it was fantastic. Mike could handle everything for me. I was like, fantastic. That's wonderful. Fast forward. Four months later, I get to the old facility for the Greater Valley Chamber because I'm going to run a class there. Anybody remember the old facility? It had that big training room. It was where the staff and traffic gas Burger station King. is right now. Yeah, yeah. Burger, right the across from the Burger King. King. I, you don't remember it. Not it had three times. They had a training room that was three times the size of this one. It was beautiful, oh, right? Gorgeous. It was gorgeous. It was great. And uh, so still disappointed that we moved away from that one. <laughs> that was a big class I there. Know. And uh, I remember it was one of the first classes. I didn't know Laura. I didn't know um, uh, Bill. I didn't know uh, uh, Nancy okay. as well, right? And and I got here a little bit late because I was trying to put the finishing touches on things entrepreneur trying to do too much. I got here late, those doors were locked. And I hadn't thought to get a key, right? And I'm like, uh-oh, this is gonna be a problem. And I had about 10 people come and pay in customers. And I'm like, oh no, what am I gonna do? And I didn't have their phone numbers. So I wasn't as prepared as I thought I was. And, and I'm like, holy cow, I've got an hour. I gotta figure this out. What am I, I can't cancel the class. That's revenue, right? That's cash. I can't do that. So I'm looking through my Palm Pilot. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> I'm looking through my Palm Pilot with my little thing, you know, and, and Mike's name pops up. I had the foresight to put his name into my my uh, uh, contacts list. And I'm like, worth a shot. So I give him a call and I'm like, hey, Mike, um, here's my situation. And he was in Shelton too. And, and I explained what was going on. He goes, Bob, he goes, no worries. He goes, just redirect everyone over. I'll stay. We have a conference room that will handle the 10 people. No problem. You can use it for free. We'll take care of you. And I'm like, oh. he wouldn't have done that if I hadn't already given a deposit into his emotional bank account, right? Mm -hmm. There's too many times that you get out there in a networking event and somebody's trying to sell you on something. 
They're trying to get you to do something different. And we always say, do it differently, right? Go non-conventional route. Don't try and sell them on anything. Just try and figure out how you can help them. There was a gentleman by the name of Harvey McKay. He talked about networking and he wrote a book back in the, in the 80s. Dig your well before you're thirsty, right? Very same concept. Mm -hmm. And he had four areas of networking. It's still a great book. He was a networking guru back in the 80s and the 90s. And uh, he had, he always bragged, he had a Rolodex. Remember Rolodexes with mm -hmm. the cards in them? Yeah. Once again, another reference that's going away. Uh, but he had a Rolodex of like 6,000 cards in there. And he always said that if you really, really want to be in touch or have a network that's going to support you in the future, he goes, you have to have these four things. First is reciprocity. What you give, you're going to get. If you're not going to give anything, you're not going to get anything back. Right? So you have to give to your network to be able to get something in return. The second thing was interdependency. His network was only as good as the other networks that were in it. Right now, I'm assuming, and I'm going to make a big assumption here that everyone is on LinkedIn. Would you agree? Right. How many of you go into LinkedIn every day or two just to see what's going on, just to check in, to say, hey, happy anniversary, happy birthday. Right. Mm -hmm. Those those things, those notifications come up every single time. And as, as soon as they come up, I'm on there. I'm trying to send it because I can tell you that just by saying happy birthday sometimes re-engages somebody in your network with you, right? Mm -hmm. Highly encourage that. Uh, he said sharing. If you're not out there actively sharing your network, introducing people <clears throat> or trying to get those introductions going, he goes, it's going to fizzle and die like a plant that doesn't have water. And the last one is keeping at it. You got to keep in touch with your network, right? Once again, those notifications in LinkedIn can help a lot. Right, or just even liking things. People watch, right? They really do. They watch to see who people, you know, liked their posts or liked their comments, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the types of things. He, uh, Harvey McKay said that of the 6,000 names in his Rolodex, he would contact them every single year, right? Now, back in the 80s, there was only three ways to contact people, right? You could phone them, you could visit them, you could write them a letter, right? Or a fax, whatever, right? Um, those were the only three ways. And he contacted 6,000 people here because he never wanted that to dry, uh, dry up on him. So build up that emotional bank account. The next one, look for opportunity in every noun, right? It's just a quick way to remember this. But anybody know who has more patents, more than 1,000 patents in U.S. history? Something like Edison? Yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah, Thomas Edison, right? That's right. And he has this great quote, and he says, opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and it looks like work, <laughs> right? Opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and it looks like work. What does he mean by that? It means that sometimes we'll overlook things because we think it's gonna add to our plate, right? We have these, what we call psychological blenders on, right? We don't look on the peripheral because we're just like, oh, I got too much. I've got to be narrow focused. I got to have a tunnel vision. And you know what he said also was that he had really two original ideas. And the rest of them were ideas that other people had that he took to the, to the finish line, right? One of those original ideas he admitted was the light bulb, right? But he took those to the finish line and imagine how big GE is today and, and how long that company has been around. It's pretty amazing when you think about it, but we have to take a look. We have to research. We have to think about and understand what other opportunities are and innovatively and creatively try to bring that in to what we're doing because sometimes we get too comfortable, right? We do one thing the same way all the time. We get just too comfortable doing it. Right. So look for opportunities, see things that others don't see. That increases our luck and our business opportunities. The other thing is being a great conversationalist. How many people here have ever gone to a social event, maybe a networking event or uh, some type of a function where you've had a little bit of anxiety about meeting other people? Anybody been there? Yeah. Why do you think that happens? 
Overthinking. Definitely overthinking. Yep. Why else? Nothing to say. Yeah, maybe we don't have anything to say, right? Yeah. A lot of it's just because we're uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? And when we're uncomfortable, we retract it, right? We look for the comfortable things that are happening. We go to the same people who sit near in a networking event or a social situation. We look for our friends. We're like, hey, there they are. I'm going to go over there and talk to them, right? Instead of really engaging and finding a way through it. Um, Dale Carnegie uh, wrote the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Anybody heard of that book before? Anybody read it? All right, good, good. Awesome, awesome. So he wrote that book back in 1936, but he wrote it based off of 25 years of research, right? So he spent 25 years learning how people operate, how they interact together, and who the most successful ones are. And the most successful people are ones that were interested in others, right? And that's how they can really carry a conversation as being interested in somebody else. And it was interesting. He had gone to a, a party. So uh, the book came out. It became an instant bestseller. The only book that was outselling it was the Bible at one point, right? So around the world, the Bible was the only book outselling it. So he became really famous. He was really a great marketer as well because he did something that nobody else did, but he put his picture on the dust jacket of his book, right? So everyone recognized who he was, right? Which back then... Cameras didn't take a lot of pictures. The only thing you time you'd see pictures is in, in newspapers. So people recognized him. It's just like if you're walking through the airport and you see somebody famous, anybody ever do that before? You're like, uh, is that? Are you sure? Mm -hmm. right. And so <clears throat> he sits down at a dinner party and a woman does that double take. And she was like, Dale Carnegie. And he was like, Yeah, yeah, how are you doing? What's your name? Right. And he started being interested in her. And he, she was like, oh, she was so excited because this was a really famous person sitting next to her. So he sat down and he started just asking her some questions. And the first question was, have you done anything interesting lately? She had. She had just gone on an African safari vacation. Three months over in Africa. She was just brimming with excitement to tell him all about it. And she did for the next two and a half hours. She regaled him with stories of this African safari vacation. And he was interested. He prompted her with some questions like, oh, and then what happened? And then how could you explain that? Could you give a little bit more detail? Wow, that seems so exciting. He showed enthusiasm and he supported her. At the end of the night, as they're getting up and they're putting their coats on to leave, she looked at him. She goes, Mr. Carnegie, everything they say about you is true. And he was like, my goodness, what do they say? And she was like, you really are the greatest conversationalist ever. He just spent two and a half hours listening to her stories about an African safari vacation. Yet he was the greatest conversationalist. It was because he maintained that interest in her. He asked her questions that prompted her to keep talking. His investment was small. The result was great. Right. And that's part of part of this uh, uh, creating a good network and building it is being interested in other people, asking them questions, finding out more about them. The next one is about negativity. Right. Anybody been around a really negative person before? Yeah. <laughs> You're in, but first, yeah. I can name four. Yeah. Right. What's that experience like? What's the experience like when you're around a really negative person? It's draining. draining. It's, yeah. it's draining. It sucks the life out of you, right? Yeah, doesn't it? Yet we get into those relationships over and over. It's like it's one of those uh, um, uh, groundhog days where you just can't get out of it, right? The most successful people, the most enthusiastic people, um, the, the ones that have the best luck are the ones that push negativity aside and look at things from a positive aspect, right? We've all had those really positive, enthusiastic friends before, right? Don't we love getting together? It's like, um, I'm going to go for another reference. This is a friend reference. Um, there was the, the, the episode where Ross and Chandler were like so excited that their friend Gandalf was coming, right? <laughs> and they were like, we're going to do this great stuff. It's coming. Gandalf is so much fun. He's so great, right? 
that's the excitement we get around positive people. And we're just like, this is going to be fantastic, right? That's the type of vibe that we want to exude out to the, the, the to our general public, is how can we be that positive person? And we found that there's certain things that you can do to be more positive. The first thing is visualizing success, right? A lot of the things that we do in our programs, when we get out there and we're working with our clients, we start off with visualization, right? I know I was just doing, uh, working with a nonprofit. I was doing some strategic planning with them. And one of the first things that we did, and it took us two and a half meetings to get through this one sentence. And that was the visualization, their vision of their future. And I kept going back to, I said, you can't move forward unless you have a vision. <laughs> unless you understand where you want to be in four to five years, nothing else is going to matter. But it's the same thing. Whether you want to be the greatest salesperson in the world, you have to have your sales vision. If you want to be a great leader, you've got to have a sales, uh, excuse me, a leadership vision, right? Vision helps us create success and it gives us the roadmap of how to get there. We also found that they don't waste time in things that they can't do, right? If they find that they're hitting a wall, they look for a way around it, right? They don't just let it stop them. But too many times people let them hit that wall and they're just like, throw up their hands, can't do anything, right? Oh, poor woe is me. Um, the next one is that they praise people. They, they recognize and appreciate other people. It's amazing. We do this exercise. It's called our recognition exercise, where we have people in our programs give recognition, compliments, feedback, appreciation of the other people in, in the group. And one of the things we always say is, is we ask before we set this, before we go into it, is how many people get enough recognition or appreciation every day? They're satisfied with the amount of recognition and appreciation that they get every day. Think about that for yourself. Do you get enough? Probably not. And it's a direct correlation to how much you actually give, right? If you're not giving a recognition and appreciation, you're probably not getting it back as well. Once you start giving out more, which is a very easy thing to do, you're going to get back more. And then the last one is... Positive people are enthusiastic. Dale Carnegie, in the research for his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, talked to the greatest leaders, industry leaders of the time. And it came back to one secret ingredient of the most successful people, and that was enthusiasm. And one of those great leaders said, he goes, if we had two people, same intellectual levels, uh, they have the same job, their abilities are almost the same, right? Their talents are almost the same. The one with enthusiasm is going to always outperform the one that has little or no enthusiasm. So how do you embrace that enthusiasm and create more positivity in your world? Last one is Dale Carnegie in his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, uh, created 30 principles to be more successful. Right. And principle number five was smile. And, you know, it's such a simple thing, but it's such an inviting facial expression. Right. It's, it's really telling people with a smile that you're open for business. You are approachable. People should want to be around you. Right. Yet we get so connected to being on point that we lose the sense of being that that smile, that engaging person. There was a guy by the name of Brian. He was in one of our programs. <clears throat> and Brian, let me let me describe Brian for you. He was about six foot two. He had a very shaved military style haircut. He was very sculpted, very muscular. And he was in the Marine Reserves. When he walked, it was a march. And he stood at attention anytime he stood up, right? So Brian was sent to one of our programs because we had to soften him up a little bit. <laughs> right? A little bit more on the time, right? And so we're up for the challenge. We're like, all right. So in the third session, Brian is still not broken through. Brian hasn't seen his breakthrough yet. So he gets up in front of the room. One of the things that we always do and the reason we're still relevant today is that we always ask people to make commitments, to do something different. And when they make a commitment, we hold them accountable by coming back and, and explaining and telling us what they did and how it worked. And so we're up here, and the first nine set of principles are the strengthen relationship principles, right? How to strengthen relationship. Principle number five is smile. 
So we get up there and we're like, Brian's up here like, like this. I'm in the back of the room coaching him. And we're like, okay, Brian, you got to pick a principal. Which one and why? And he goes, um, I can't do this. I'm like, hey, Brian, get off the front of the room as soon as you pick a principal. He was like, you know what? Fine. <laughs> you know, he kind of hollered that out. I'll do number five. And how come, Brian? Just cuts. Okay, Brian, yep, that's intimidating. You go right on. <laughs> so the next week or two weeks later when we're doing the review on this, Brian comes in and he's pulling at my arm, right? And I'm like, oh, geez. Oh, okay, Brian, what can I do for you? And Brian's like, I want to go first. Today. I want to do my report up. And I'm like, that's fine, Brian. You can go first. So Brian marches up here and he goes, uh, the principal that I picked was number five. And, you know, we we're all like, okay, um, you know, tell us a little about it. He goes, well, he goes, I'll be honest with you. He goes, I didn't know what number five was. And I'm like, when did you find out? He goes, well, I was thinking about it on the ride home. So I pulled over to the side of the road and I looked at my book and I saw number five with smile. And he goes, I started hitting my head against the steering wheel. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. He goes, when am I going to smile? I'm like, oh boy, this is going to be a good one. And so Brian said, you know what? Next morning, he's an early riser. He gets in the work at around 5.30. And around 6 o'clock, he goes and down to the cafeteria. When they open, he's one of the first in line. He gets a large coffee, black, and he gets a bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich. Right Now, he's a Marine. He's muscular. You know, those are important things to him. So he said, what I did was, he goes, I figured I'd try out the smile thing with the, uh, with the person at the cafe. Right? She's the only one there. Um, and I'll, I'll try it out. So I'm like, so what happened? He goes, well, it didn't go very well the first time. Right. I go, well, what do you mean? He goes, and I, my muscles aren't practiced in smiling. Yeah, I did one of these <laughs> kind of like Sheldon did that smile. Like, right. Oh my God. In the big bang theory. Right. <laughs> so he goes, I did that. She stepped back, <laughs> stepped back. And I'm like, well, what happened? He goes, but then I got the hang of it and I started smiling more and we started talking, right? And over the course of the week, this is Monday, so this is Tuesday morning that he tried it. He goes, by, by Friday, we were coming in and we had this, this banter, this rapport. We were just conversing all the time and it was, I was smiling because, you know, it just felt good. And I'm like, so that's fantastic. I go, so wrap it up, what happened? He goes, no, no, Bob, he goes, let me tell you. It gets even better. I go, how can it get better than that? You've made a new friend. Right? He goes, no, 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 Bob, it gets better. I said, well, what happened? And he goes, well, by the end of the week, he goes, I was getting extra bacon, extra cheese, and extra <laughs> eggs on my sandwich. He goes, how can you go wrong with that? Just because I smiled. <laughs> right? Once again, it's a welcoming, inviting gesture to people that says you are open for business and you will find new ways of dealing, working with people. So once again, <clears throat> create your opportunities, create your own luck. All it takes is a little bit of investment, a little bit of strategy, a little bit of thinking, and things will start happening for you. Sometimes you gotta take a chance, sometimes you gotta try, but it will happen. So uh, George Bernard Shaw said, people are always blaming circumstances for what they are. I don't believe in circumstances. The people who get on in this world are the people who get up and look for the circumstances they want. They can't find them, they make them. You all taking that start by joining a group like this, and how you just gotta branch that out even more and all your success is gonna happen. So I wanna thank everyone for allowing me to come and talk to you tonight. Uh, once again, we're Dale Carnegie. Uh, we have our office up in Naugatuck, but we cover all of Connecticut. Um, if there's anything we can do to help you out, please don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, thank you for allowing me to come. Thank you. Great presentation. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Uh, two quick questions, Bob. Yeah. So something about uh, going, uh, we're just walking into a room, right? Mm -hmm. Or we're setting up into these networking yeah. events, right? And we're intimidated. 